Okay, and we're going to move on to our panel now. We're so thrilled to have just such a fantastic group of people who have agreed to come together to talk about some of the issues that we know are challenging all of you. Uh, we have Dr. Jill Abramson, myself, Dr. Harvey Cohen, Dr. Richard Finkel, Dr. Holly Tabor, and Dr. John Day will moderate for us. So we're gonna move right into our first case. So issues of requests for second therapy. A four-year-old boy noted to have a new motor deficit was diagnosed with SMA type three and started new Sinerson therapy. He initially showed improvements and achieved stable, stable motor function. Now eight years old, he continues to receive new Sinerson therapy, but is now having greater difficulty climbing stairs. The family presents to clinic to request the addiction, pardon me, the addition of Ristaplam. So some of the questions that uh, clinicians have, have mentioned to us is, you know, how should we really think about whether to add a second or third line therapy, thinking about those benefits and burdens? And when can, how do we think about whether another agent might be helpful, harmful, or perhaps neutral? And do we have obligations to offer second therapies or third line therapies? When might we say no? And how does cost influence these decisions? And Dr. Jill Abramson is going to bring a very interesting perspective from her work at, at CCS. Thank you, Dr. Abramson. Thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this here. Um, these issues certainly weigh on us at CCS and Medi-Cal. Um, CCS uh, and Medi-Cal are driven by the uh, need to cover what's medically necessary. Um, cost is not a main consideration in what we cover. Um, in order to determine if it's medically necessary uh, for something as costly as this, we want to see that it's prescribed by the neuromuscular medicine specialist. And then uh, we also want to see that the patient characteristics are similar to those that are in the studies that demonstrate its efficacy. Um, and so that's our primary goal is making sure that there is evidence of the efficacy. In this case, with a request for a second therapy, it's relatively straightforward to uh, replace one treatment with another. So it would make sense cost-wise to stop the nucinersin and add the risk, um, the EVRISD. And so it's more challenging to see adding a second therapy. And the problem with the second therapy is that there is not currently peer-reviewed evidence demonstrating that uh, that it makes a difference, that it's effective, that it's the, you know, the best solution at this time for this patient. So we are really stuck with not having the literature and the evidence to support it. Now at CCS, we want to do everything we can to protect and support the children um, in California with a, this condition. And so sometimes if the literature doesn't exactly describe that it's effective, we can ask for a series of cases in which it was shown to be effective and the reviewer can be a little bit flexible because we are tasked with making sure that it's necessary to treat and ameliorate the condition and we try to take a broad perspective as we look at that. Um, in terms of, uh, I pretty much went over when we would say no, uh, do we have an obligation to offer another treatment? And I, again, in this particular case, the question would be, could one start with just a single other treatment? Um, because that would seem to be more cost effective and it's not clear uh, whether there's additional benefit with two treatments versus one in this case. So Thank let you. me turn it over to the rest of the panel for thoughts on the clinical side of, of how this makes sense. I mean, Thank you. One of the things I'm hearing is a is a call for research to ask that question, so that people like yourself would would be able to make more informed recommendations and choices along with clinicians. Absolutely, absolutely, that's right. You're very helpful. I wonder if any of our other panelists would like to weigh in on this question. 
Uh, let me share a few thoughts, if I may, because uh, this exact question is coming up uh, rather frequently now in the clinic. Uh, and I think it, there are really uh, three different scenarios uh, that I'm challenged with. One is uh, where a patient is being treated with uh, a drug that increases SMN protein, and that might be nusinersen, or it might be the gene therapy, the Zolgensma. Uh, and they, they now want to add a second drug. And they say, we're, we're very grateful that we have this drug, but we really, what, what else can you do for me today? Uh, and so you get into a discussion, as you just heard, that, well, there really is no data yet to support that. And we don't yet have a good way to really identify whether your child even has the capacity uh, to be able to measure whether your child would uh, even uh, have a likelihood of benefiting uh, from adding a second drug that increases the SMN protein. So we get into that discussion. The second scenario uh, is uh, sequential treatment. Um, so not at the same time, but you've been treated with the Zolgensma and uh, you're, you're showing improvement. And then what about adding a second drug, knowing that the Zolgensma, that gene therapy is continuing to provide some benefit? Uh, at least we would hope so. And th there's an indication of a long-term sustained durability of effect there. So that, uh, we don't know that answer yet either. Uh, the third one uh, is, is a switch. So not so much adding, but uh, gee, I, I'm, I'm struggling, with, my child is struggling with the spinal taps and the sedation. Um, and we just think it's gonna be a lot easier uh, to move over to Rizdaplam. Uh, and uh, and assuming that the payer would agree to that, uh, I think you have to have a discussion to say, well, there's a risk in doing that. You might lose uh, the uh, clinical benefit that you've seen from uh, one treatment like Nusinersen by switching to another treatment because we don't yet have good head-to-head -head comparisons. Um, uh, in fact, we don't have that at all yet. So I think that's a, uh, a concern. The But there's another uh, type of additive treatment, which is when you're adding a second drug that has a, a different target. So there's drugs in development now, such as the Scholarock drug, which targets muscle. And, and there's a very good rationale for that, but I think we have to wait for the, uh, the data to come out from those studies. So, I, so to me, the challenge is in trying to educate parents to step back a little bit from what they've learned uh, largely from social media, as you just heard from Dr. Burkhart, that uh, they come in with a certain amount of information, but it may not apply to their particular child. Thank you, Dr. Finkel. Yeah, I agree. I think we see that across medicine that, you know, patients obviously get a lot of information from the internet and it's often um, incumbent upon us to try to, to filter through that information with that patient and with that family to figure out what's right for them and their, or their child. I'm going to move on to the next case. So case two, a delayed diagnosis. Parents present to your clinic with an extremely weak one-month-old infant. The patient was diagnosed at another hospital with infantile botulism. Testing reveals the baby has SMA. You consider Nusinersen, but given the patient's advanced weakness already, you're not sure if it'll be helpful. You worry with such advanced symptoms already, the treatment may extend her life, but it may be too late to preserve the functions older SMA patients have told you make their lives meaningful. You call a palliative care consult to think about this question with you. So do we have an obligation to offer non-curative treatments? Do we have an obligation to offer comfort care, a form of non-intervention? How do we advise parents when the choices are not clear? How do we address our feelings when parents make a choice that may be different than what we hope for or expect? And we're gonna ask Dr. Cohen to have the first, first uh, crack at this question as our palliative care expert. Well, thanks a lot, Dr. Berger. And thank you for inviting me and our uh, palliative care team is, uh, to be part of this. Uh, you know, the, the questions often asked is, why did you ask for a palliative care consult? Uh, this is not the child who's imminently dying. And, and I think it's really firstly important to know that palliative care um, is there for not just for children who are at the end of life. We are often asked 
to see and, and should see children with co chronic complex life-threatening illnesses, especially when decision-making is important as it is in this instance. I think the roles of the palliative care consultant are to help understand the patient and family values, uh, to determine if the families really understand the medical situation and the rationale for any kind of uh, uh, suggested treatments. We also have among our team uh, experts in pain and symptom management so that we can offer a, an additional therapy for the child over and above what they're getting for the direct treatment of their disease. And we can be there as a support for the patient, the family, especially the siblings. Um, it, it's important to know in pediatrics that, that palliative care is part of what's called concurrent care. And that is that one can be on palliative care and still receive disease-related curative or non-curative treatments. Um, and it's really uh, uh, sometimes very helpful to have us introduced as part of the team so that we're not seen as replacing the, um, the care team, but actually being part of it. And we wanna be available, not just for a decision now, but for future decision-making. Uh, just let me add one other thing. The responses I'm gonna to give to answer these questions are, are mine and not necessarily that of the palliative care community, but I hope they might be helpful. In terms of the first question, do we have an obligation to offer a non-curative treatment? Well, my clinical specialty is oncology, and we are often at a place where we do offer non-curative therapy, but we have to be truthful when we do that. If the treatment is not gonna cure the disease, we do need to let the family knows that, know that we, with our therapy, cannot cure their child. It doesn't mean that they shouldn't have hope and prayers that maybe uh, God will help them if that helps uh, they're going through the, the process, but, but we have to be truthful that medicine will not cure their disease, child's disease. Um, it's important though that we, we are obliged to present therapy that might increase either the quantity or quality of the life of the child. That is, uh, whether we um, would necessarily recommend it or not is another story, but I think it's important that we at least um, give the family that, that option. Um, and it's, but it's also important to discuss the difference between doing something for their child or to the child. So even if we think there's a treatment that might um, uh, do something uh, for the child's illness, but not necessarily help the child, it's important that we talk about that difference and how uh, the role of the parent is, and the physicians are to be sure that we are concentrating on doing things for their child and not just to their child. So, um, so the, then the next question is, uh, do we have an obligation to offer comfort care? Quote, non-intervention. Um, well, I actually think that comfort care is actually an intervention and it's an important intervention. Um, it's not doing nothing. I often hear my colleagues in oncology say, well, we can offer you drug A, B, or do nothing. I think uh, comfort care, uh, palliative care, are as intense therapies for the child and the family as disease-related treatment. And so we often say that it's really not doing nothing. Um, how do we advise parents when the choices are not clear? Well, in, in part of that, advi that advice, it's important to understand the ethical, spiritual, and community values of the family before we advise them. We also need to let the family know that a decision to start a drug is not necessarily irreversible. And that if it would help the family to have a recommendation from the medical team as to how to proceed, we will give them that recommendation from the team. So it's not really only their decision. We're not just saying, what do you want me to do? Uh, we're, we're also obliged to make a recommendation. Well, how do, um, uh, how do we address our, uh, our feelings when parents make a choice that is different from what we might have uh, uh, hoped for or expect? Um, it's, uh, that's, that's really hard because it's important that we support the family uh, in their decision-making because in a sense, they have to live 
with that decision much longer than we do, since if the, if the feeling is that the medicines may not work, the child is likely to die. Um, it's, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's something that, that, that once the child dies, we, we usually go on with the other things that we do, but the family lives with that. And so, so often we'll uh, agree to continue a treatment for the child if the family wants to, but we make a, 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 a sort of a contract with them, not any binding contract, but we agree that, that to support them in their request for ongoing treatment, as long as they um, are, allow us to make sure the child is not suffering. And in the process, we continue to stress comfort measures as being increasingly important so that at some point, almost always the family comes to the decision that it may be uh, ongoing treatment was, uh, was not the right, ongoing treatment for the disease was not exactly uh, the right thing to do. So I hope this is helpful. Thanks so much, Dr. Cohen. I think it is helpful because when we're, you know, when we're thinking about a patient like this, who's already presented with advanced symptoms, I think it's important to think about for those of you as, as experts in neuromuscular diseases, what, what biases do you have on your own when you approach any one of these cases? And how as, as clinicians, we don't necessarily see the options the same way as a family would. And so when you talk about that, that honest discussion of what types of non-curative treatments are available and what does that mean and navigating that with, with that family, different families may have different priorities and make a different choice. And I think being able to, to walk that road with them as you've described is, is just so important and valuable. Uh, thank you. I, I absolutely agree. And, you know, sometimes we're asked, well, what would we do if it were our child? And that's a tough question to answer. And I know people differ in how they respond to that. Uh, but my response is that, first of all, I don't know, because I've never been in that situation. And to, to be presumptuous enough to say I know what I would do would be incorrect. But even if I had been in that situation, the decision that I would make would be based on my values and, and my uh, way of responding to changes in, in life. And that may not be the, the, the right thing for that family. And that's why it's so important to try to understand as best we can what motivates the family to either ask for or not want uh, certain treatments for their children's diseases. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, um... When I have observed those kinds of conversations, I often think, and I've seen clinicians, including including you, Dr. Cohen, um, frame what a range of families do in these situations. So rather than what we would do, say, you know, I have seen families who choose to do X because X, and I have seen families who choose to do Y because Y, and that range of options and values is all permissible and exists so that people feel there's permission to consider a range of values without projecting our own sense of what we ourselves would do in that situation. Absolutely true. And, and one other point is uh, I, sometimes it's very helpful to not necessarily put all the burden on the family to decide what to do, but to ask them whether it would help them if the, their physicians would make a recommendation. Because it's sometimes easier to, to agree with what's recommended by the physician than to have to say yourself, do or don't give this medicine to my child. Absolutely. I'll give some follow-up to this because I think it's pertinent. Um, with regard to this particular case, the family did go on to treat the patient and supported the patient and poured tremendous time and effort into the patient's life. The patient nonetheless died about a year and a half later and uh, the family feels that they absolutely did the right thing and that it was just wonderful to have this child as part of their life for that period of time. Another family made a similar decision and uh, uh, was not and poured all the resources of time and effort they could into it. The family broke apart and the child ended up in foster care and the, the family uh, totally regrets having gone down that path. I think it just speaks to the idea that it's very hard to predict from the outset exactly how this is going to play out. Yeah, that's true. I don't think we can use the end result as a rationale for what we do. I think we have to make the decisions 
based at the time with the family. And sometimes we're wrong. Well, and that um, unfortunately re regret is part of being a human being and being part of being part of this, you know, human family and that we obviously want to provide as much support as we can to to every family to minimize that. But that, um, as you said, we don't we never know what that experience will be like for for an individual family. So case three, we're going to talk about newborn screening. A two year old asymptomatic infant girl presents to your clinic after referral based on a positive newborn screen for SMA. Her parents listen to the information you present. However, they express that their child is perfect and very strong. They refuse any intervention and state that they will not be returning to clinic since their baby is fine and there's no reason to follow up. You offer confirmatory genetic testing to look for copies of SMN2, but they refuse. What is the clinician's obligation to the patient and to the parents? How might you partner with this family knowing their child may eventually develop symptoms? And if the child develops clear symptoms, but the family continues to decline any follow-up or therapy, how will you respond? And are we in a place to require any therapy, given potentially, even potentially asking a court to compel uh, certain treatments? And I'll hand it over to Dr. Finkel at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start by saying that this is a very real scenario that uh, I, in fact, have been in this exact situation uh, as a consultant. I was the third doctor that the parents came to for an opinion. Uh, and sometimes multiple opinions can muddy the waters rather than provide clarity. Uh, uh, and I'm sure other clinicians have faced this as well. Uh, so it, it, let me share uh, my thoughts on this. Uh, when we're in a situation where the diagnosis has been made by newborn screening, in effect, uh, we're using a diagnostic biomarker. It's a genetic test. And uh, the child is uh, frequently asymptomatic or what we would call pre-symptomatic in this situation. Uh, and how different is this from identifying in, let's say, an adult uh, that they carry a cancer predisposition gene uh, that puts them at high risk, let's say, for breast cancer? Uh, and uh, how that uh, individual adult decides uh, whether or not to proceed with uh, different treatments, uh, knowing that uh, they're at high risk for developing a malignancy, but may not have any evidence of that at the time. So this is not entirely unique to this situation, but I think what we do know here is that uh, we have uh, at our hands uh, certain tools that allow us to predict uh, if and when this child is actually going to develop symptoms. And then we would have to do further testing to look at the copy number or other biomarkers to try to define that. But in this case, the families uh, declined to have any further testing done. And they're basically taking a, a nihilist approach. Uh, so how then does uh, the clinician try to engage with this family and serve as an advocate for the child uh, while uh, making sure that you're not alienating the parents, the caregivers, um, and importantly, uh, engaging in a discussion in a non-confrontational way, because I think that's particularly important. Uh, and this is where we have to be a physician and, and maybe not a scientist uh, and uh, say, how are we going to try to uh, provide uh, some care for this child going forward? Uh, even if on your exam, you say, yes, this baby indeed is very strong, looks totally asymptomatic, but knowing that uh, there's a disease lurking uh, inside this little baby uh, and motor neurons are being lost every day and that we're not going to be able to recapture those once they're lost. And once you do see uh, evidence of weakness, uh, you're not going to be able to fully recover that. And even with all these magical drugs that are now available, uh, you know, we would be able to stem further decline, uh, hopefully even show improvement, but we're not going to get the child back exactly to normal. So in that situation, I think as clinicians, we all feel compelled to be an advocate uh, for the baby. Uh, and yet we, we have to do it in the context uh, of uh, the parents being the legal guardians. Uh, and how do, we, how do we balance that? So there's several, uh, I think, uh, issues here to maybe address. Because uh, it's uh, it's the obligation to both the patient and the parents, as in that first 
uh, bullet point. And uh, so to me, you, you have to get, uh, I think, uh, the faith from the parents that you're, you're going to listen to them, you're going to work with them, you're not going to present your own personal biases or opinions, uh, and, you're going to be, and you're going to accept and validate uh, the parents' uh, perspective. Uh, so to me, that's the first point is that you allow, at least you open the door to an ongoing dialogue and that you don't alienate anybody at that very first visit. Uh, so uh, how do you then partner with the family? Because they're already saying, we're not planning to come back. So I think you have to uh, try to uh, resonate with them uh, that there is an importance for them to come back, at least uh, to be able to uh, continue with the discussion and, and see how the child's doing, even if at that point in time, they don't see a need for that. And that's, that can be a challenge, uh, but I think that's, it's important that you somehow find uh, the way to engage them. Uh, so if the child develops uh, clear symptoms and signs and the family continues to decline follow-up, uh, how would you then respond? Uh, so to me, uh, again, uh, this is where I think we need to be an advocate for both the patient and the parents, but when do you call in uh, the troops? When do you uh, want to get uh, the ethics committee involved? When do you want to get a third party to say, hey, um, I think uh, I need somebody to be uh, an advocate for the patient, even if that means going to court. And indeed, uh, this situation has come up uh, in not myself personally, but I know of other cases where people have gone to court to try to mandate treatment. And I think that's uh, certainly an aggressive approach, but uh, and I don't think you, you want to use that as a threat to the parent. Uh, how different is this from the family who's a Jehovah's Witness and they're declining any blood transfusion and you feel that a blood transfusion would be life-saving uh, in that case? So I think there, there are other parallels um, that you need to try to keep in mind uh, as this uh, child evolves and becomes potentially symptomatic. So I, I don't have the answers for that, but I think uh, there's, to me, uh, sometimes a bit of a conflict here of trying to make sure that the family and the parents have autonomy uh, to make decisions on behalf of their child. Um, and that may conflict with uh, what you see as your role as the physician to provide uh, what you think is a life-saving, life-preserving uh, care for the child. So uh, I'm gonna stop there and uh, turn it over to other members of the panel for their thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Finkel. One, it's interesting that you bring up the issue of patients, for example, who are Jehovah's Witness faith. Um, I think one of the things that's really interesting about that comparison is that oftentimes um, those cases are recommending a single transfusion. Certainly there are children who have ongoing transfusion needs, but I think there's a, a pretty interesting difference between compelling a single treatment in a single period of time as opposed to a patient who needs ongoing therapy constantly. And I, I don't personally feel that we're in a position today to really compel the use of the medications that are currently available for SMA. I think there's still enough uncertainty and enough, uh, enough um, potential side effects, et cetera, that, that certain families may not think those are the right thing for their child. And I still think that that's a valid choice. I think the concern here would be if you're not able to, when a child does develop symptoms, to get that patient just the basic care that they're going to need in terms of support services, social support, um, additional therapy, and things like that that are not necessarily medication-based, but physical therapy, OT, etc. And those may be, I totally agree with you, really focusing on that communication and, and building that relationship over time. And I think um, I agree with that. And I agree with also what you said, Dr. Finkel. I think, um, you know, it is important though to contextualize this in how we think about parents who often have a surprise with an infant with uh, other kinds of disabilities and maybe a life of um, their view. They have very little experience with having children with disabilities, of course, um, or knowing anyone else with a disability. Um, this may not be what they thought they were signing up for. Um, they may see, I see there's a, a, a question in the chat about um, 
about uh, you know PT and other medical interventions and those kinds of things. I think there there is this balance where we want to sort of give parents room and support to come to terms with things, but also I think at this stage we are increasingly less tolerant as a society with parents choosing to not treat a child with disabilities because they don't want to have a child with disabilities. Certainly historically, you know, there, we let parents um, stop interventions for infants with Down syndrome and we don't do that anymore. Um, so I don't think SMA is in that stage yet for all the reasons Dr. Burgart said, but I think it is really important to, to think about where we're on the boundaries of those different issues about parents totally understandably coming to terms with a very challenging diagnosis or not wanting to come to terms with it in the case of this example, perhaps being reluctant to do so. And, um, and the bounds of what treatments we think may, may at some point become standard of care, um, even if it does not completely quote unquote cure the disability. It's actually a really uh, wonderful article this month in the Atlantic Magazine about, um, you know, children with, uh, in spe with specifically trisomy 21 and kind of who lives and who dies based on prenatal screening that is conducted. And I think we're seeing that as well with SMA and some concerns in the SMA community about, you know, what will this community look like in the future? And I think with that, that, that is an excellent article. I think with that in mind also, I think going back to your um, excellent point, Dr. Finkel, that, you know, when do we call in the troops, I think is how you said it. Um, and, you know, I think if a family has a child who has a potentially undiagnosed or untreated condition, and they refuse to bring that child for interventions at some point, um, that is something which eventually may well require other interventions to make sure the child gets treatment that they need, separate from whether or not they're getting one of these particular therapeutics that are targeted towards SMA. So, um, and I think uh, I see Jill making a comment, uh, Dr. Abrams making a comment about um, connecting with the child's PCP, a potential avenue to partnering with the family. I think that's an excellent idea. Um, uh, and I have seen that work well sometimes. And I've also seen that not work well sometimes, or sometimes families just being very, um, having, um, personal beliefs or cultural beliefs that make them very suspicious of Western medicine. So perhaps they don't have a PCP even for their child for regular well pediatrics visits. So that's a challenge as well. Great, thank you so much. This I is our final, oh, I'm sorry. Well, maybe I'll just add one. I think we have enough time. I mean, because I think it's relevant. The one uh, patient we had differed from the, the uh, case that was presented uh, uh, in several important ways, but uh, was a patient uh, diagnosed on newborn screening with Pompeii who did have um, early signs of that disease and the family refused uh, uh, treatment based on the idea that the child was unaffected. They refused to hear it. And this went on and on, but eventually we did call an ethics consult and the, the interpretation was the family was, was uh, in their rights to refuse treatment, but they could not uh, uh, fail to acknowledge the presence of the problem, that they had to at least acknowledge that there, that there was this issue. I think this has come up in the, in the chat on uh, Hoover as well, of, of you know, that, there, that there is a distinction between whether or not the family is acknowledging the threat or the risk and whether or not the family is opting for the treatment. And uh, that, that's, a, a, I think, a, an important distinction. Well, and is it an informed refusal, essentially? Mm -hmm. Are you refusing because you really understand the situation and the benefits and the risks, or are you refusing because you, you can't slash won't understand the situation and the benefits? Right, the and I think to that point, yeah, we have to recognize that these parents are in a state of shock when they receive this diagnosis based on newborn screening because they take home from the hospital a perfectly healthy looking little baby and they're told a few days later that there's this horrible disease lurking inside and of course <laughs> dial to that and there's there, they, so you have to acknowledge that and deal with that side of it as well while you're providing them information about this disease and treatment options and that there's a sense of urgency to consider starting treatment uh, so i so just speaking personally i have found that particularly challenging I agree with Dr. Finkel, and um, I think it's important that in this instance to find out um, what, what is there something that they just you know have not 
understood about what was presented. And also, Dr. Finkel, to your point about continuing the discussion, because as you said, the first time you're told this, you know, and you see a normal child, you may not even believe it. But often one of the most important things, as you said, is to not set up the antagonism, but, but an alignment and try and try to um, have a better understanding of the consequences of their decision. Uh, that's often helpful. It's not a guarantee, but certainly setting up a, a, an antagonistic approach is a guarantee that it's not gonna work. Absolutely. Um, someone on Whova had asked for the Atlantic article, so I've posted a link uh, in the Whova chat. So case four, a 25-year-old software developer with SMA3 presents to your clinic to be evaluated for Nusinersen or Ristolplam. He declined Nusinersen several years ago because he said he was happy with my life and wasn't concerned about further loss of function. He works for a video game development company and recently noticed a decline in his ability to control his joystick, which he depends on for work and wheelchair use. How can we help this patient consider his treatment options? And what do we know about the experiences of adults with SMA who have stable function versus those who've experienced a decline in function? And at this point, I'll hand it off to Dr. Tabor. Yeah, thank you. Um, and um, I think that one of the reasons why um, uh, this is a case we wanted to make sure we included is a lot of our research and a lot of what clinicians have been telling us says that adults with SMA type two and three are really having some different experiences, conversations, and sort of weighing of values. Um, and that sometimes, not all the time, um, their views of those values and priorities are changing when they notice a decline in function. And I will We'll um, ask Dr. Day in a minute to comment on this, or Dr. Finkel, but I think um, there are many people who think they're at kind of a stable level of functioning and they think they're going to stay at that level of functioning perhaps for the rest of their lives. And then they're surprised when they find out that they're not. In fact, um, uh, the one of the articles, um, um, Matlin, that we uh, one of the books that we showed in the end of our talk, talks about um, how he suddenly lost his lost his ability to control his wheelchair and do some other things that he had been able to do for decades, and that that was really surprising to him. We had at least two or three participants in our study who were adults say exactly like this case that they did not want to pursue therapy until all of a sudden they started to lose function, um, and then they became uh, more, became more urgent to them to try. To to preserve the function that they had. Um, so I think it's a different balance of benefits. And I think, you know, one of the things we mentioned in our article is that um, uh, recommendations is for clinicians to really engage um, uh, adults with SMA in discussions about the natural history and the possible trajectories. So that even if they're not having a decline in function now, they can start to think about the values about what they would want in that situation and start to think about at least with what we know now about what options are available and knowing that there's a lot of um, changes and moving targets with new therapies, what might be available and what the benefits and risks might be. Um, and that for, for individuals with all forms of disability, including SMA, um, quality of life is really important. And when they think therapy may, may, may um, influence their quality of life, that's where they may want to be more proactive in seeking out therapy and treatment. But Dr. Day or Dr. Finkel, do you want to comment on your experience with these patients and their views of the trajectory or their experiences when they do start to see declines in function and ability? Sure. I'll make a quick comment. Uh, to me, the, the central issue uh, in dealing with uh, teenagers and, and adults is uh, managing expectations. And so I think you have to get in their head and, and get an idea of what's important to them. Uh, and use that as your frame of reference. Uh, and then uh, in, in some cases, we have very limited data from the clinical trials to be able to answer or at least anticipate how a specific adult patient may respond. That data is emerging, but if I think we, we start off with the idea of um, where, where is this patient from a natural history point of view? Can we try to anticipate uh, where uh, he or she will be in one year or five years? Um, and what are the expectations for that patient as far as maintaining their independence and their function? And then use that as the basis for discussing uh, the different interventions. So John, let me hear your thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Richard. I think this is really an important issue. I mean, 
uh, one of the problems, if you want to think of it this way, with regard to spinal muscular atrophy is that these patients are cognitively intact. So they're, they're tremendously creative. And in adult patients, I've often heard uh, them say, well, I've, I've remained stable now for many years because I can continue to feed myself. But then you have, as you ask more questions, you find out that they've been compensating in various ways where they've gone from eating with a knife and fork to changing the food they eat so they, they can manipulate it more easily to then adapting with an elbow support to then adapting in other ways. And so yes, they can continue to feed themselves, but only by that adaptation. So it's as you say, Holly, they, they, they act and feel as though they've, they're stable. Whereas in point of fact, there is a motor progression there. And then eventually they get to the point where they, they no longer can easily feed themselves. And, and so there is a sudden change by that perspective. So that's a challenge for us uh, that, that, you know, and I, I don't want to, you know, make people more aware of their deficits, but at the same time, I do want to help them understand that there is likely going to be a progression of the disease. We're then confronted with the problem that we don't have good evidence to show that the treatments that we now have available really alter that. And it's, it's it, because the drugs uh, are being approved for all SMA patients, irrespective of their age or level of, of ability, it makes it very hard for us to come up with a trial design that is going to adequately prove uh, the efficacy of treatment in these situations. So we're, we're dealing with a different uh, level or type of data in the real world data as opposed to in controlled trials. Uh, so it's a real challenge and um, I don't have an, a, a specific answer to it. And the way we end up confronting this with patients is just going through the, the discussion with them so that they understand what our goals are and we can work together to try to achieve them. Yeah, and I think that I will say that in our research, I think a lot of the adults with SMA types two and three were actually both disappointed and quite frustrated that drug companies and funders were not actually funding research on how these drugs worked in their population. They were somewhat suspicious of taking it for that reason. Um, they worried about pressure to take it, and they were really quite honestly, in some cases, angry that there was not an effort to do studies about this. And I think it's a very valid point. Um, and it's another way in which certain subpopulations get neglected, um, probably unintentionally, but they get neglected. The other thing about the, I want to mention one, a uh, couple of answers to some of the questions in the chat, because I can't talk and look at the screen at the same, I can't type and look at the screen at the same time. Um, uh, someone asked about videos of families in similar situations. And I will say through our social media um, research, that is one of the things that patients were doing at the beginning of these approvals and are still doing is showing videos not just of actual improvement and progression in SMA type 1 patients, but also showing videos and talking about what it's like to get these drugs and these infusions, about how they're managing side effects. There's this real idea of video sort of testimonials, but also we called it virtual witness, this idea that you're seeing what's actually happening. There are good and bad things about that. It's not the same as scientific data, um, although I think there is actually in this era of COVID an effort to, effort to figure out how trials can leverage off of that to, to do some things virtually. Um, but those videos are important. And I think um, Connie Wolford, I think you made some really good points in here too about um, misunderstandings and ignorance of how the drug works. I will say a lot of the adults who said they changed their minds and decided they were going to try Spinraza specifically, or Incinicin specifically, were saying it because they had had communities online through social media groups. So explain how social media works for SMA and for a lot of rare disorders. It's not like um, you're just seeing social media through for people who use social media through your feed, you know, that I'm seeing what John posts and Alyssa posts and all these different people post. You're in a group that's specifically, you know, adults with SMA too, or, you know, um, uh, different subgroups. And there are specific comments or posts specifically to that group that you see in your feed, but it's not like your regular updates about, you know, the cake you baked on your social media. Um, and, and, and I will say that that, that form of sort of testimony is also where people 
people are getting information. Um, and if particularly when there is a lack of studies um, that are trying to get this information. And sometimes a lot of adults, again, may not have a, a neurologist who has a lot of SMA expertise. And so they, they may feel like they get more of that. They even get names of, of neurologists they can go see from these groups. So I think how we balance this sort of democratized information, you know, pseudo-democratized information through social media, the scientific data, the data from the companies and the limitations to that, um, and the, the clinician patient encounter is, is, a, is a challenging thing. No, I, I, I think that's, those are really well, well made points, Holly. So thank you very much. I will say that, you know, we are getting some support from uh, companies to try to investigate this uh, adult population, but it is, it is challenging because uh, we, we, we aren't in a position where we can do controlled trials anymore. And uh, there's so many variables in this population that it's just impossible to control for them all. So I think we, are, we have reached time. So unless anyone has any final comments, I think we're gonna take a 10 minute break and then we will reassemble for the final uh, uh, plenary session uh, that gets us talking about um, uh, the sitters across the lifespan in terms of the SMA phenotype presentation before we break into our, our uh, breakout groups. So thank you very much. Uh, to the panelists, and thank you very much to Drs. Tabor and Burghardt for leading this uh, for us. Thank you. <laughs>